This week, the focus is on monasticism. You know, it might seem a little foreign and, of course, kind of strange because um, monasticism is not usually something that that is considered a part of everyday life for just the you know regular lay Christians, but even diocesan clergy. I mean. We go to monasteries, you go for retreat, you go visit, but, you know, this, the intention of the church was always to integrate. And so what the monastics accomplished and did in their lives was meant to not only inspire the rest of Christians, but also to offer tools and ways of of deepening our faith. And so, uh, so we're gonna pre- begin with prayer and in the Byzantine churches, so the tradition for this, the fifth week of, the, of Lent is the prayer of the great canon of St. Andrew of Crete. And, um, and the canon that he composed is specifically, it is a monastic prayer that has become popular even in in many parishes, although it's done as a uh, shorter uh, shorter service, not always done in its full entirety, which runs approximately, I think, about three hours. And um, but the the most beautiful part of it is that uh, it gives us a um, in a sung form in a poetic way, the history of salvation and, um, and specifically the mercy of God um, at every step. And so um, it is also very much biblically based. And so I'll begin, we'll just pray um, the first ode. And, um, and so just, just listen, listen along. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A helper and protector has become salvation to me. This is my God. I will glorify him. The God of my fathers, I will exalt him. For in glory has he been glorified. Glory to you, our God. Glory to you. Where shall I begin to lament the deeds of my wretched life? What first fruits shall I offer, O Christ, for my present lamentation? But in your compassion, grant me release from my sins. Glory to you, our God, glory to you. Come, wretched soul, with your flesh confess to the creator of all. In future, refrain from your former brutishness and offer to God tears and repentance. Glory to you, our God, glory to you. Having rivaled the first made Adam in my transgressions, I realize that I am stripped naked of God and of the everlasting kingdom of bliss because of my sins. Glory to you, our God, glory to you. Alas, wretched soul, why are you like the first Eve? For you have wickedly looked and been bitterly wounded, and you have touched the tree and rashly tasted the forbidden fruit. Glory to you, our God, glory to you. The place of bodily Eve has been taken by the Eve of my mind in the shape of a passionate thought in the flesh, showing me sweet things, yet ever making me taste bitter things. Glory to you, our God, glory to you. Adam was rightly exiled from Eden for not keeping your one commandment. O Savior, what shall I suffer? Who am always rejecting your living words? 
Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Trinity adored in unity. Take from me the heavy yoke of sin. And in your compassion, grant me tears of compunction. Now and ever and forever. Amen. O Theotokos, hope and intercessor of those who sing to you, take from me the heavy yoke of sin. And as you are our pure lady, accept me that repents. A helper and a protector is he unto salvation. He is my God, and I glorify him. God of my fathers, and I magnify him, for he is greatly glorified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The, um, the uh, canon of, of St. Andrew of Crete is a, you could say it is a reflective prayer that um, um, thematically uh, brings us before the history of salvation and the history of sinfulness, and then um, applies that history also to, to the individual. And, um, you know, so it, it, it is one of the, one of the Lenten themes is repentance, it is forgiveness, it is reconciliation. And, um, and so the, this, I, this life of St. Mary of Egypt, this is something of a, an interesting example that the church has received. And so um, I sent it in the email, the, the text, and, and it reads, it's not a long, long text. And um, her life story uh, comes out of kind of a fascinating um, little historical reality of monasticism in the desert outside of Jerusalem. Um, in previous weeks, we've talked about monastics and ascetics, and um, ideally, all monastics are also ascetics. And uh, some ascetics are monastic or have been recognized as being monastic in, in as much as they lived as hermits or, or in some, some sort of a community. So uh, just as a recap, ascesis, uh, which is the uh, root word, the Greek word for uh, asceticism, uh, means in Greek, exercise and training. And asceticism within the context of the Christian experience and the Christian faith is a uh, self-discipline, and abstinence from worldliness and earthly pleasures and luxuries. And as an, as an exercise, so it is, it is not simply a choice, but it is rather a integration and living out of that, that challenging reality. And so Mary of Egypt, if we're going to talk about the, the way where she fits in, uh, she is recognized firstly as an ascetic because her life is a life lived in uh, self-denial and self-discipline uh, after, of course, after her conversion. And um, however, within the context uh, of the life of St. Mary as it was written down, so we can also understand that the, the church and the monastics saw her also as a monastic, as a, we would say, hermitess, as someone who lives isolated from the world. So let's, uh, let's take a little a look at her life, at some of the, um, the details, because there's, there's a lot to, uh, to look at and read and understand. So uh, 
I looked up, you know, just out of interest, because there's always, um, people are always looking for patron saints. And so, so I thought, I wonder what Mary of Egypt is a patron saint of, um, you know, desert living, retirement in Arizona, you know, stuff like that. You would think she could be a very good patron saint of that. And unfortunately for her, she only has one group that she is the patron saint of. And the group are repentant prostitutes. So it's a, it's a pretty limited group there. Uh, but in her life, nonetheless, we see this, um, the experience of metanoia. Metanoia is, has become one of those those popular Christian words. And, and it comes from uh, Greek, where in the original Greek context, it means turning around. So it means completely changing one's view or one's direction or where one is going. And in the, in the context of the spiritual life, so metanoia means a... Uh, genuine conversion which includes mind and heart uh, mind being the place of thoughts and convictions and processes and the heart being the place of emotion and so it is it is in that sense a complete conversion and the example of mary of egypt so we see uh conversion, uh, contrition, or regret for what she lived in her life prior to her conversion, and then a, a commitment to austerity, to extreme austerity. Uh, she became very popular in the church right from the 8th century when uh, the uh, the life of St. Mary of Egypt as written by uh, St. Sophronios, the patriarch of Jerusalem, that began to spread. And it spread specifically through monasteries and monasteries that went from east all the way far to the west. Uh, and so, so it is interesting because I think in my conversations in these past years with different people, Many people have never heard of St. Mary of Egypt. And, um, you know, and so it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, in the West, she was very, very well known. And her uh, image actually decorates uh, some of the great cathedrals uh, of France and, um, and Spain. And churches were dedicated to her in Italy. Um, and even there are stained glass windows in chapels in, um, in Britain dedicated to her. And so she was, she was very well known. I think for whatever reason, she has uh, slipped a little bit into obscurity. Not so with the Christian East. In the Christian East, she has remained one of the pillars of the Lenten experience. And one of the most favorite saints of Lent, too. Because although her story is um, so extreme and very difficult for us to connect to on a personal level... Uh, her story is, uh, is one that, that moves the heart. And in the conversations that we have, um, you know, between her and Father Zosimas, um, there is a, uh, not only a humility, but there is something about her that is uh, motherly. There is something about her that is uh, very authentic, and um, 
And there's just something in those few words. We don't know. We don't. There's no other life story of hers. Uh, she did not write her own biography. There's nothing else we know. And um, and this was the way that monastics lived. And you know, in previous weeks when we spoke about monastics, uh, hermits specifically would disappear into the desert and never be seen again because they focused only on living a life focused exclusively on their relationship with God. And so their goal was not to be uh, famous or to be recognized or canonized as saints. Um, their goal was purely one of, uh, of self-discipline in order to attain spiritual perfection. And if that meant being anonymous or being unknown and dying alone in a cave, you know, so be it. And that is what happened to many. There are a great many monastic saints, monks and nuns who live the hermit life, whose names we don't know and God only knows them. And Mary would have followed that route too had it not been for uh, Father Zosimos. Um, so Father Zosimos is the beginning of this entire uh, story of St. Mary. And, um, and we're looking, this is in the sixth century. And uh, Father Zosimos is a lifelong monk from his childhood he has been attracted to the monastery. And he was born and raised probably in the shadow of the monastery where he entered. And it is in Palestine in the Holy Land. Uh, he has lived the life of a monastic, challenging himself through self-discipline, through fasting, through prayer, and, and he has attained uh, certain gifts and uh, spiritual gifts, we could say. And after over 50 years in the monastery, he comes to a point uh, which one could say, and it's, but it's not said in the life, one could say that, that he was being tempted that after 50 years, he had come to the conclusion that he was as close to spiritual perfection as he was going to be. And that realization, well, that's that self-awareness, you know, that's not a good thing. That's when Adam and Eve realized things, that's when they knew they were naked and everything went downhill. And so his, that attitude, it caused him some concern because he wasn't sure what to make of this and where he could, um, you know, if this was going to actually harm his spiritual life. And so he prayed and in his prayer, he was, uh, he was told to go to another monastery and that he would see great things. An angel appeared to him and instructed him to leave the monastery. And he was to go to this other monastery that was close to the Jordan River. And we don't know which monastery. We don't know which monastery Father Zosimos was living in. We don't know which monastery he went to because there were many monasteries in Palestine and in the Holy Land. Since that area was touched literally by the feet of Jesus and the early church, and of course, by the blood of martyrs, so many were the men and women who were drawn to that desert to live the monastic life there. And so, um, so Father Zosimos decides uh, to go to this other monastery. He does as he was instructed by the angel. When he comes to the monastery, so he presents himself, but 
the monks who see him arriving, the doorkeeper, and then he gets introduced kind of up the ladder before he gets introduced to the abbot, the head of the monastery. So they're looking at him kind of, you know, probably a little surprised because he's a monk who's a, you know already in adva advanced in age so he's not a young person coming to the monastery and so they're not sure what to make of him and uh, he likewise he comes there thinking that there in that monastery he is going to uh, find someone who is uh, spiritually more advanced so that he could learn from them. And so he speaks with the abbot, with the superior of the monastery. And um, the abbot is um, very nonchalant in his conversation with him. And... Um, <laughs> not quite sure what to make of this, this monk who obviously has already a great deal of spiritual experience behind him. He welcomes him into the community, but there is no real um, agreement or promise that is made. And as he joins the community, so he begins to observe, observe other uh, elders. And we see that word appear in the, uh, in the text. Elder, in, uh, when it comes to talking about monastics, uh, elder means someone who is already tried and proficient in the spiritual life. And an elder would be someone who could have spiritual children. He could be a spiritual guide within the monastic community for both monastics as well as non-monastics. And so the, the elders are not just one person, but they're, they could be more uh, persons within the monastery. And they're recognized by the rest of the monastery. So it's not like a, it's not an appointment, you know, where, you know, so-and-so uh, Father John is going to be the spiritual father of the mon monastery. It's not like that. This actually comes out of uh, more of a recognition by the other monastics that Father has gifts that he can see or do or teach in ways that, that reflect uh, his experience. And, um, and so Zosimos observes this and he sees elders who have attained a certain level of spiritual uh, perfection. And, and he mentions uh, this, or it is mentioned by uh, Patriarch Sophronios in the life of St. Mary. He recognizes that there are some in that monastery who are proficient in their prayer and they pray incessantly. So when we were talking about monasteries a couple of weeks ago and, and monastics, constant prayer, the practice of hesychasm, of sacred silence and meditation on um, on prayers such as the Jesus prayer, being meditative and repeated over and over. And for so many years that that prayer becomes tied to the rhythm of one's own body, the heartbeat, the breathing. And so this way, at any time, day or night, the, these monastics are at prayer. And then another practice that we also spoke about a couple of weeks ago was that they did not sleep, that they stood. And, uh, and this, this being the uh, fifth, sixth century, so that was very popular. At that time, that practice was an ascetic practice that uh, had spread throughout monasteries. 
not everyone was cut out to do this, obviously. And, uh, but it was one of those ways that monastics try to express their control mind over their matter. And so, uh, so that, that ascetic practice of, of not sleeping and standing was, was one of the things that he observed in this other monastery, which leads you to believe that he did not see that in his own monastery. He did not see the practice of, of, uh, of sleeping or of not sleeping. And um, then there is one unique practice that is in this new monastery that he is in. And it is a practice which is found in many other monasteries at this time that during Lent, the uh, monks, and this was a practice specifically for uh, male monasteries, because it was not exactly safe, and for, uh, for nuns, it would not be safe at all. But during uh, Lent, the monks would uh, pray on that Sunday right before the beginning of Lent, they would pray together, receive communion, and, um, and then uh, have a, a service of mutual forgiveness and reconciliation with the, the entire community participating. And then the entire community, with exception of two monks, would go into the desert one by one. And, uh, and they would spend the entirety of Lent up until Saturday before Palm Sunday, uh, praying in the, de in the desert uh, and uh, leading um, spiritual exercise, so ascesis. And, and this was a unique practice. Not every monastery did this. Some did, some did not. The two monks who were left behind in the monastery uh, were left there so that uh, services would continue to take place within the monastery walls. And so they were usually they were they were ordained priests and not lay brothers. Um, some of these monasteries, if you've been to the Holy Land, so uh, in the Judean desert, the monastery of Marsaba, which is from the fifth century, uh, when you, it's almost like hanging off of a, the side of a cliff. And uh, underneath it, there is what is, I guess, a kind of a seasonal uh, creek that runs through there. But of course, you know, tens of thousands of years of water running through there have carved out the stone. So it's a canyon. And interesting, along the sides of the canyon, when you're standing at the very top, looking way down, it's like, you know, a good uh, 500 feet deep, if not more. And so you can actually see little caves. And uh, these caves were places where uh, the monastics, the monks would go uh, for uh, hermit experiences and retreats. Uh, included was the, the the for the time of Lent. So this was not an unusual thing, um, you know, these kinds of practices. But not every monastery did it. And Father Zosimos's monastery, uh, his original monastery, did not do that. And so, um, so Father Zosimo sets out and uh, begins to wander in uh, the desert, not sure of what's going to happen, probably a little worried because in the, um, uh, in the life of St. Anthony of Egypt, so uh, temptation and the devil takes the form of wild animals that attack St. Anthony in the desert. 
And so, uh, so he, I'm sure he's very much aware of the possible um, dangers, not only uh, physical, but also and especially spiritual. And so he is walking and discouraged. 20 days he is walking. So basically half of Lent is gone. And he has not really made any discovery. And he is praying to God that God show him uh, one of these hermit monks who has been lost to society and is just living in the desert alone and nobody knows about him. So he is praying for that experience because his ultimate goal is that he be able to progress in the spiritual life where he feels that he has hit kind of a dead end. And, um, and so as he, is, um, as he is praying and dealing with his own frustrations, uh, he sees a, a shadowy figure on the horizon before him. And um, this figure approaches him very slowly. And since he thinks that this figure is a monastic hermit uh, or an ascetic living in the desert, he begins to uh, approach the figure. At that, the figure falls back and becomes uh, distant again. And, um, and he continued to move closer, and then the figure spoke. And the words, Father Zosimos, come no closer. I am a woman. Throw me your cloak to cover me, then you may approach me. So he was astonished for a couple of reasons. Well, firstly, that the figure would be a woman in the middle of the desert. Secondly, she called him by name, which kind of freaked him out also. And through his head, he had running immediately. The reaction was, uh, this could also be some demonic apparition. You know, the devil knows your name too. And so he becomes uh, worried and uh, perplexed. But as she comes closer to him, uh, he's, he has these questions running through his, his mind. And, the, uh, and she understands. She knows what he is questioning and what he is thinking. The, uh, he also uses, so Sofronios uses um, an expression in this part of the life of St. Mary, uh, where uh, he puts into the mind of Father Zosimos the thought that this woman has died to this life. And that is the definition that is associated with monasticism. So, so Patriarch Sophronios, in writing this, he views her as a monastic, so as a hermit. And, uh, and so that's, that's an important uh, moment also because that connects her story to those who are living the monastic life, monks and nuns. So she is not just a, a lay person in the desert or just an ascetic who is, you know, not at all connected to the monastic tradition. Now, as they have this conversation, so um, there, there is, there are a number of important moments there. He, he is surprised that she recognizes not only his name, but she also recognizes his priesthood. And when she anticipates in their conversation, she anticipates what his questions are. 
and what his doubts are and what his fears are and that this could be a demonic uh, manifestation uh, when she anticipates that. So uh, he asks for her blessing, you know, that she bless him because he recognized that she is a great ascetic, a great monastic also. And uh, she does not want to bless him. And she asks him to bless her. And, uh, and he doesn't want to bless her. And so uh, they're kind of at a little bit of an impasse. But Mary says, you are a priest. So you must bless. And so Mary wins. That's one for Mary. So he asks her then, after having blessed her, he asks her to pray for him and to pray for the world. And, um, and she does this. She turns to the east. You know, these are, I, I like these little details really, uh, um, I find them fascinating. But, you know, the tradition of praying towards the east because uh, Jesus is going to return to the earth from the east. You know, the prophecy of Daniel. There's like, so there, there is a lot that's put into it. And so she, in the desert, out, you know, without any church, she turns to the east to pray. And as she prays, so she raises her arms and she is lifted up before his eyes. And he's, of course, he is looking at her not from the front, but from probably the side or the back. And, um, and that for him, that becomes another, um, well, it's, it becomes a mixed, a mixed moment where he becomes scared, thinking that, again, perhaps this is something of the devil. But he is also awestruck. And at that, um, that moment, he begins to weep. The gift of tears. Uh, she hears all of the things that, is, that are going on in him because she, you know, and this is, this is part of the ascetic life. Uh, those who fully live asceticism receive gifts from God. And so they're able to uh, do or understand something different, something that is not the, the usual. And so she hears his thoughts and, uh, and she responds to him and she assures him that she is flesh and not a ghost. And, um, and she also tells him that her prayer is real. It is authentic, that it is not something fake because he tries when she is praying, he tries to hear her words and he's unable to, to hear what she is saying. And so that's when he gets that temptation. Maybe she's not really praying. Maybe she's just a ghost. I mean, he starts all of a sudden doubting and, you know, and then she's floating. So he's like scared. Is she a ghost or real? And so what we would say, I guess, confusion. He gets a little confused because he's never seen something like that. And uh, at that moment, when she returns to speaking with him, so he goes and he embraces her feet as she stands in the sand. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a very, um, I think, a very key point. That's when he finally realizes that this is the one that God has sent him to instruct him. So for the next uh, level of perfection. And so he, at that point, asks her to instruct him 
in the way of perfection. So the way that it begins is, of course, by her telling him uh, her life story. And uh, her life story is, I think, uh, probably what surprised him the most of all. So Mary is uh, born around the year uh, 444 uh, in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, Alexandria was um, kind of like LA, Los Angeles. It's a huge city, had a lot of different cultures, but a lot of problems too. Um, you know, places which uh, uh, were extremely lavish and rich and then extreme poverty. Um, at this point in the fifth century, uh, Egypt is completely Christianized. And hence why Mary's name is Mary. She was born to a Christian family. Uh, however, growing up in that kind of a setting in that city, she was tempted, tempted by uh, the lifestyle that that city could offer her. And so at the age of 12, she ran away from home and went deep into Alexandria. And there she found out that um, the easiest way to get what she wanted and to support herself was to sell herself. And so she became a prostitute. And, uh, and as she uh, worked uh, for a number of years as a prostitute, at the age of 28, she saw uh, people gathering at one of the docks and, uh, and she inquired there where they were going. And, and she was told that a group of people was waiting to board a ship to go to the Holy Land. That they were going to the Holy Land for the celebration of the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. So the feast is celebrated on September 14th. And so she thinks, well, I've got nothing to lose. I might as well try this. And she sees some of the people, young men who are waiting to get onto the ship. And she thought, you know, I could probably make a bit of money uh, working that cruise. And so she went and uh, got on the ship to the Holy Land without any sort of a, you know, religious or spiritual idea or notion. And um, she worked her trade all the way to the Holy Land. And, and she admits it in the life, in, the, in her life, when we read specifically, that is one of the things that she regrets, uh, that she was able to seduce men who were going to the Holy Land for uh, spiritual pilgrimage and growth. And yet she seduced them to something more human and carnal and base. And, um, and so she comes to uh, the city of Jerusalem and to the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, which was built by uh, the mother of Constantine, Saint Helena. And uh, the Basilica has been around already for a uh, a little bit over a hundred years. And uh, it has within its walls, the tomb, it has Golgotha, and also has uh, the relics, some relics of the true cross. And so she decides to follow the crowd because it was a festival, since it was the celebration of the, the finding of the true cross, so uh, there were pilgrims there from all over. And some like the Egyptians had traveled there for a number of days to get to the Holy Land on, 
by sea so that they could celebrate the Feast of the Cross in the city of Jerusalem at the relic of the cross right by Golgotha. So she tries to, with the crowd, get in. And yet every time she's being even pushed with other people who are pushing their way into the door, she ends up always being left outside. It's like something always keeps her out. Finally, when everybody else gets in, she herself tries to go through the door and she cannot. She has stopped. And it's something, some uh, invisible force holds her back from entering. And so she went and um, in front of the doors in the courtyard, she just sat down there kind of dazed and perplexed as to what was happening and why. And it is at that moment that she catches sight of an icon of the mother of God that was on over the door. And, um, and at that moment, she gets uh, clarity. And she realizes that the life she has been living has been um, filled with sinfulness. And it's not just her sin, but she has caused others to sin as well. And um, at that moment, she goes through a process of um, the, you could say, a confessional process where all of her sins are before her. And she completely uh, accepts responsibility for everything that she has done. And then she prays that God forgive her and that somehow Mary help her to uh, change her life. And so <clears throat> she goes into, she is able to step into the Basilica where she venerates the cross and she comes out of the Basilica and goes to the icon of Mary, the mother of God. And uh, she asks her uh, to show her, to guide her as to what she should do. And she made a promise to, to the mother of God to lead a life of penance. And she heard uh, a voice tell her, cross over the Jordan there you will find glorious rest. And so be, there begins her journey. So she leaves from the Basilica and uh, she goes, stops at a bakery and uh, purchases uh, three loaves of bread. And she sets out, she asks the baker, um, where uh, the River Jordan is, and he sends her in the right direction. And as she gets to the River Jordan, she arrives at the monastery church of St. John the Baptist. And possibly it's the site of the baptism of Christ. We're not exactly sure. There are some traditions which say that because there, of course, there is a church of John the Baptist. There are few at the site of the baptism at the Jordan River. And so um, she goes there to church, to liturgy, and she receives communion there. It is, it is implied, I guess you could say, that her confession before God uh, was the confession, like the sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, and then her blessing with the cross was the forgiveness, because usually, you know, the priest's blessing is connected to absolution. And so being blessed by the true cross, um, you know, that that was the sacrament there being expressed in the story, because we don't have any 
moment of confession that is specific in, in this part of her story. So she uh, receives communion and then she crosses uh, the river Jordan and disappears into the wilderness. Uh, and we're told that she uh, ate one of the loaves of bread. And um, the wilderness, the Judean desert is, uh, it's not exactly the desert uh, that we see like in the Southwest with sand and cacti. Uh, it is a desert that is very rocky that has many caves. It has uh, different kinds of trees and plants uh, that grow there, but it's not a particularly uh, friendly place to live. It still has the extreme temperatures and of course the lack of water and edible uh, plant life. Uh, and of course, there's there's the wildlife that lives in the in the desert there that is also uh, may pose some danger to the individual. And so she continues with telling her story to uh, Father Zosimos, and she says that she uh, comes to this place where they meet. And, uh, and he asks her, well, how long has she been living here? And she tells him 47 years. And in 47 years, she has not seen any other human being. He has been the only one. And, um, and so he asks her then, well, how have you been eating? You know, how can you sustain your life here? And she said, she responded, well, I still had two and a half loaves when I came into the desert. And in these past years, uh, the dryness of the desert has preserved the bread. Uh, although it is as hard as a rock. And so little by little, I have been eating from these loaves of bread for 47 years. Uh, and also uh, occasionally wild dates and edible plants uh, have, uh, have served as nourishment. Uh, but she also told him that she has not seen any human beings, no, even no animals, and that she knows very well the torture uh, of thirst and how the devil uses these desires against her. She also told him that at times her body was afflicted by the cold and by the cold of winter and the heat of summer. And in these moments, she was greatly tempted and by uh, memory of the luxuries of Alexandria, of the slightly sweet Egyptian wine, uh, other indulgences of her former life. But at these moments, when she was most tempted, by memory of her life, of her previous life, the mother of God interceded. And Mary herself comforted and consoled her and strengthened her. As she continues to speak with Father Zosimos, so he is very surprised at how many references she makes to the Old Testament, specifically to Moses. She feels a kinship with Moses because he guided the people of Israel out of her native land, Egypt, to the Holy Land where she is now living. And of course, he has the experience of the desert, which is her, uh, 
the previous 47 years. She also finds a kinship with Job. Job who is assailed by many different sufferings and yet is unwavering in his faith. And so, uh, and then she also quotes a lot the Psalms. And so uh, Father Zosimos asks her, because I think he's impressed. Zosimos, in, in, uh, at the beginning of the life of St. Mary, uh, so uh, Patriarch Sophronios mentions that Father Zosimos has the gift of continuous prayer and teaching scripture. And because not everybody could do that, you know, scripture is dense as it is, and and uh, and it's not just about the interpretation of things. You have to be familiar with the context, the language, you know, Hebrew, Greek, and you know. So there's a lot that that is would be expected from someone. But he had a gift for teaching scripture, and so that's why he reacted to Mary's recitation and quoting of scripture. And so he asks her, um, you know, how is it that, uh, that you are so well-versed in Holy Scripture? And, uh, and she tells him, in my life, I never learned to read or write. In the 47 years in the desert, God has been my teacher. And, you know, this, this is something that, that for him was remarkable because, uh, you know, here is a woman who is illiterate and who is a penitent. And she is this wonderful theologian of God's word and um, and and that's uh, um, you know she is the theologian of the divine word is the is actually in in some of the translations and so again he was moved to prostrate himself before her and he begins to address her as holy mother and that's, again, it's a beautiful monastic title at recognizing uh, the character of hers that was not only ascetic, but also monastic. And, um, and so as he prostrated himself before her, so she once again uh, was airborne in prayer. And, um, and once again, and this is the nature of the, I think, the, the desert where he gets that little doubt in his head. Maybe I'm hallucinating. Maybe this isn't real. Maybe this is the devil. It just, and it runs through. And, you know, that's how temptation happens. It's like, it, it's, it's, it's not always, um, you know, some big moment or some huge thought, you know. Uh, it's little things that run by at a high speed. You know, it's almost like a, you're, you're hit with a BB gun of bullets, of little pellets that, uh, that make you doubt or second guess, or, you know, they distract you from what's going on. And so, and in the same way, that's exactly what happened to him. And uh, Mary turns to him and tells him, do not doubt. Know that I am but a woman and I am a sinner. And so uh, he then, there, the conversation continues and uh, she tells him, because he, he is, um, you know, the fact that she is a great spiritual teacher she is instructing him her life is serving as a model of what can be done through penitence conversion metanoia 
and you know and seeking god in in the most inhospitable place and uh so of course as a monastic because although the monastics were living on their own you know monos does mean alone um and hermits were very common the uh one of the ideas also was that uh, when someone attained a spiritual maturity, that they would share it. You know, it wasn't like you couldn't be selfish about that. And, you know, that's why we have the tradition of, of uh, mystic mysticism in literature, you know, where you have uh, uh, saints who have written about their journey from, you know, the little flower to John of the Cross you know, and so St. Mary of Egypt is no different, as well as many other monastics whose lives we read. And so <coughs> she requested, though, that he not share her story with anyone until after her death. And he agreed with that. And so the, uh, so this is, mid-Lent, so he would be heading back to the monastery, um, making his way uh, for so that he would be back at the monastery for Palm Sunday. And so she asked him if he would uh, meet her at the Jordan, that he would not cross the Jordan, but that he would meet her at the Jordan the following year on Holy Thursday. So not that Holy Holy Week, but the one that would come the following year. And, uh, and, he, and he said, uh, obviously he was a little uh, perplexed because the practice of going out into the desert and being out there for all of Lent, and then he would come back to the monastery and uh, get communion for her so that he could take it to her. Uh, so he, he wasn't sure if he would be permitted, you know, to accomplish that. Because as monastics, you know, they had been away for all of Lent, and now the intensity of Holy Week was to bring them together. And she told him, she said, that he would not be going out into the desert uh, during Lent the following year. And to him, he wasn't sure what that really meant, but, um, but he, figured, um, he figured it out a year later when Lent found him sick. And so he was very sick, sick enough not to be permitted to leave the monastery. And so he remained at the monastery, whereas all the other monks left. And uh, he recovered right in time for Holy Week, right in time for Palm Sunday. And so then on Holy Thursday, bearing the gifts, and she asked specifically that he bring her the body and blood of Christ, and uh, and so he made his way on Holy Thursday to the river's edge and waited there. And as he waited there for hours, uh, Mary was not arriving. And so he became worried that perhaps something had happened to her. And he was even thinking, you know, well, Mary lives on the other side of the river. How is she going to get to me here? The Jordan River, if you've been in the Holy Land, so it's more of a Jordan Creek at this point, but uh, it was a bigger river. And especially in springtime as snow melted in the mountains. And so the river was, was nourished from uh, Mount Hermon, a Northern Galilee. And so it was a bigger river at that time. And um, so as he waited there, uh, he 
caught sight of someone on the other side of the river coming towards him. And, and it was Mary uh, wearing the uh, cloth. He threw his monastic cowl, which would be like the kind of a long sheet that is, is tied at the front of uh, underneath the beard. And so he threw that to her. And so that is what she was wearing. And, uh, and as he stood there waiting for her, so she crossed uh, the river by walking on the water. And, uh, and once again, he was uh, awestruck and, uh, and just uh, you know, looked at, at this, this woman whose life story he had uh, zealously kept private uh, in that year between meeting her the first time and this current time, uh, he was uh, very mindful. He wanted so badly to share her story with others, but, um, but he did not. And so when, um, when she came and, uh, and as it said in the story, she, she made the sign of the cross uh, above the water uh, as she stepped out over it and, uh, and walked across the river, stopping uh, on dry ground right next to Father Zosimos. And um, he, she instructed him to pray and so they prayed the creed together and the Our Father. And then uh, they exchanged the kiss of peace. And the kiss of peace, the idea behind the kiss of peace, of course, is to seek reconciliation with uh, the people you pray with primarily. That's why it happens in church. Because if we're coming together, that there be no issues or jealousies or competition or, you know, whatever human nature brings about, but that we be reconciled. And so they exchange the kiss of peace and she receives the body and blood of Christ. And then uh, she expresses uh, her devotion and recites the words of the prayer of Saint Simeon, who receives uh, Christ into his arms. Uh, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Uh, Father Zosimos offers her, he offers her, bring some food, something that she would be able to eat. He brought some dates, some figs, and lentils in a basket. And uh, she accepts three lentils out of all that. Three lentils. It's not three pounds of lentils. It's the little itty bitty tiny lentil. Yeah, she took three of those. And, um, and she thanked him for all he had done and asked him to pray for her. And then she asked him that he would return in a year to the place where they had first met. And then she crossed the river again by walking above the water. And so the year goes by and, uh, and Father Zosimos has become very uh, anxious about seeing Mary. And he was also when he brought her communion, because there is, you know, when, when you're close to someone who has achieved that level of spiritual um, perfection, uh, there is something in us who are in process and imperfect and very much far away from that. There is something in them that attracts people, it attracts us. And, uh, and so 
uh, he felt that for her, he wanted to see her, to be close to her because she literally, she was filled with the presence and the life of God. And, uh, you know, she was already in her way of being. So she was already uh, heavenly in some ways, you know, normal people do not float. You know, there are certain things which do not happen. Uh, and so these gifts of being able to read his heart and his thoughts, you know, these things really showed him uh, what an incredible uh, power uh, Mary had. And so um, he comes back to the place where they had originally met. And there in the sand, he finds her body and she has died. And uh, she left a message in the sand. She wrote in the sand the words, Father Zosimos, I beg you to bury the body of Mary. Render earth to earth and pray for me. I joined my Lord on the night of his passion, having partaken of the divine and mystic supper. And so she received communion. She returned back to where they had met. And all in the same night, she died on Holy Thursday night. Holy Thursday to Good Friday. And, uh, and Father Zosimo, so he... There he is standing in, you know, sandy, rocky uh, land where there is really, um, you know, it's impossible to pick up a stick and dig a hole. And so, um, so he begins to uh, softly, he begins to sing the funeral hymns uh, for Mary. And, uh, and he says the prayers uh, for the burial of the dead. And he finds a stick and begins to scratch at the earth, trying to see if something will happen. And at the same time, he is emotionally moved. He is crying and he is chanting these prayers and singing hymns. And all of a sudden, out of nothing, a lion appears and the lion digs the hole with his, with his uh, bare mastiff claws. And, uh, and so uh, then Father Zosimos is able to uh, bury Mary. And uh, the lion, uh, in, a, in a way, bows before Mary, but also before Father Zosimos, and then disappears into the brush. And, uh, and so Father Zosimos then returns to the monastery, and finally he can share this story with the monks. And, but what happens is the story is preserved in uh, in purely uh, oral tradition. So it's only passed on by the monks to other monks as being told, so not written. It is Patriarch uh, Sophronios who, uh, when he was in the monastery, he decided to write it down. And so he wrote the story down and then cleaned it up and produced the life of St. Mary of Egypt. And so giving us then the text. And the text was composed in the seventh century. Uh, so it's not necessarily that many years uh, after the life of Mary and, uh, and Father Zosimos. So, uh, Mary of Egypt dies on April 1st. Uh, her feast day in, in the church is April 1st, both in the Eastern churches as well as in the Roman church. 
and it is the year 522. And Father Zosimos uh, dies in the year uh, 560. So he, he lives on, he dies at the ripe old age of 100. But gives, it gave him both the, the time to tell the story and also to, uh, to, I think, incorporate many of the things that he had learned from, uh, from St. Mary of Egypt. Now, St. Mary, though, uh, has become, because I mean, the, the story is beautiful, and, and when, you, when you read it, uh, there, is, there is so much depth in the way that they speak, you know, it's not many words. You would think that, you know, uh, it's kind of, we, we would say it's a short story. Uh, you would think that in a story of that size that you couldn't get a feel for uh, just how uh, gentle and sensitive and mild mannered and compassionate they both are. You know, she is uh, worried about him in this motherly way, and he becomes attached to her and actually calls her, you know, Mother Mary. And, um, and then, you know, he brings her food, you know, things that are, it expresses there's a lot of tenderness there, that that relationship, I mean, realize that these two, met each other but twice and yet the that meeting the intensity of um witness and sharing uh you know made up for years of not being you know knowing each other it's a it's really really a beautiful story that way i would like to uh share with you some of the photographs that I have found just to, uh, to show a little bit about uh, St. Mary. So this is the traditional icon that shows Father Zosimos bringing communion to Mary. And there in the back is the Jordan River. Then, uh, but going back a little further back, uh, this here, this is Mary going to the River Jordan when she is first leaving Jerusalem. So that is what the, uh, what the Venetians thought the Judean desert looked like. It's not quite like that. This is actually a painting by famous uh, Venetian artist Tintoretto. And um, so it's from, I think, right before uh, 1600. And um, then here, this is from around the year 1100. <coughs> this is St. Mary of Egypt. This is a stained glass window in the Cathedral of Chartres in France. So her popularity was, uh, I would say, quite big. Uh, <coughs> this here is another window from Chartres showing uh, the conversation between Father Zosimos and Mary of Egypt. And then this here is also from Chart Cathedral, and it is the burial of Mary's body. And note, you've got Father Zosimos on the right, and on the left, there is the lion. The lion in this case is doing even more than just digging the hole, but he's actually helping bury uh, the body of Mary. Then 
this here is actually in a CZ. And this is um, Mary receiving the uh, cloak from Father Zosimos when they initially met. And so, uh, and, and this is already, I think this is done by Giotto. Um, and, but it shows uh, a certain understanding also for the human body. And so she's, she's very uh, subtly uh, covered up by sticking her in a cave. So that was one way of doing it. But there are other ways of doing it too, which I can show you here. So this is a scene, this is from the 13th century. It is from a royal breviary. Uh, Book of Hours. It's a little small, but here in this one, again, Father Zosimos is giving his cloak, and Mary, her entire body is covered by hair. So that's one way of dealing with uh, the issues of uh, propriety. Uh, then there is, let me see if I can find this here. Then this is, uh, this is a painting also done by one of the Italian masters uh, showing uh, Mary, I think it's the death of Mary or it would be Mary's soul being taken to heaven. Uh, the angel is holding communion there before her. So uh, it is, again, showing with, with all of the hair covering her body. It's a way of dealing with that. And finally, oh, and here, I think this is, a, this is, uh, this is the communion of Mary. It's also beautifully done. And this I believe is also done by one of the Venetian masters from the 17th century. Now the interesting thing, I do wanna point out the interesting thing that on this one specifically, Mary is not receiving the blood of Christ, which is in the story, it's very specific. She asks Father Zosimos to bring both body and blood. And so on that painting, she can see she's getting a host. So it's like, ah, that's okay, a little bit of artistic liberty, but inaccurate with the telling of the story. And uh, then finally, this is by one of the Spanish masters, um, uh, depiction of, of Mary in the desert with the bread. So the, the interesting, uh, as I think you can see with the artistic evidence that I have brought is that the popularity of Mary, even though for us today, she might be uh, less known uh, in the Eastern churches, she's very popular, but in, in the Roman Catholic Church, she's a bit uh, uh, unknown. And, uh, and yet, the, it's very interesting that when we look at the, uh, these paintings done by the masters, you know, because that, I think that the Spanish painting, I think that was done by Ribeira. I mean, it's like you've got really important names who are painting her. Uh, and she is decorating the walls of uh, the Basilica in Assisi. You know, so she, she is uh, very well known for someone who has but a short story written about her life. Uh, she has really become uh, um, kind of the symbol of uh, metanoia, of conversion and redemption and then of doing penance. I mean, those 47 years, although, you know, Father Zosimas initially uh, 
greeted that news of 47 years with, you know, well, how did you live? How did you survive? Only then later did he realize that in those 47 years, there was a transition from her having those needs of food and being tempted by desires of the flesh from her past life to being able to, you know, walk on water and float and, you know, no longer was she tied down to those things of the earth. So, you know, it's, it's quite a, quite a, a life story. Um, and it's given to us just to remind us, uh, you know, of what we need to do to have that conversion, turn to God, let him work in our lives, you know, bring us uh, into that that relationship with him that uh, transfigures, that changes, that makes whole and heals, you know, so so she's she's a good she's a good saint. We do have her at our parish. She was one of the first saints that was added on to our walls, and uh, right behind her is the Jordan, and it's even labeled so that no one can mistake that. And then, of course, behind her is all of the that desert landscape. But but yeah, it's because her example is is so beautiful. And she is, in a way, she is a special uh, model and mother. So, um, yeah, as far as I saw the question of if it could represent Mark, it could because uh, you know, in in that in that sense, uh, Mark is the um, uh, is the evangelist who is associated with the city of Alexandria. Uh, so there is an Egyptian connection, but I think also there was uh, in the in the deserts. So there was always are those kinds of deserts. So there were those kinds of wild cats that lived there, and uh, you know. So I, I think that's that's just one of those animals that would be uh, probably found there, and uh, so I, I think it's. Not not quite a symbol, but it could be interpreted as that also. Okay, anyone have questions or comments or observations? You have to read a little bit in between the lines. And uh, the fact that she goes through this process when she's figuring out about going to the Holy Land. So um, she thinks, well, I can, you know, trade favors for travel, which is pretty much prostitution. <laughs> That's a kind of the definition in that sense. And so, so she was, she was kind, she was using uh, her, her sexuality to get stuff. So it, it's, it may not be, you know, uh, someone who is standing on a street corner downtown, you know, but nonetheless, there is a, a utilitarian purpose. She's living off of that. It is making her life comfortable. They are meant to, to share it but it, within the context of um, humility. So that's, you'll, get, you'll get some authors who will uh, ex share their experience, but they'll do it like anonymous. I, I also think she was, she was probably aware that had word of her got out that uh, other monks may come looking for her to talk to her. And especially because, you know, she has spiritual gifts, kind of the same thing that happens to Simeon the Stylite. You know, he goes on the column and people keep on coming. It is not. Oh, I'm sure that somebody claims to have some relics. Uh, Father Zosimas did take the cloak 
uh, from uh, that she wore for the last uh, year of her life. Uh, that was his cloak originally. So he did take that from her body when she was buried. She was buried naked. And, uh, and he took that as a relic. Well, she left home. She ran away from home when she was 12 years old. And she knew enough that Alexandria was the place to go and you know live the life and so so she wasn't i i don't i think she might have been from a, a comfortable family you know, especially if she was um in you know in pursuit of uh, desires and wants of the flesh so there was really no need for her to to read or write and so she just kind of you know forgot it I think it's interesting when she writes the the message in the sand for uh, Father Zosimas. I'm like, well, apparently she knew how to write a little. <laughs> she probably did read and write, but was what we would still refer to as kind of functionally illiterate. That's the, the awesome thing there is that uh, God gets uh, Father Zosimas after 53 years of monastic life. He gets him into a monastery where he would let him, they let him loose for Lent into the desert. Because in his monastery, they don't do that. And so he went to that monastery not to learn from the monks, even though he was observing them and seeing yeah there are a lot of guys here who are elders you know who are advanced spiritually but he didn't see anything there that was particularly you know moving for his journey and so the but that was arranged so that he would by chance encounter her in the desert god brought them together The long hair in icons and in art uh, was a way of preserving modesty. It was a way of covering her up. When Father Zosimas found her in the desert, all her clothes in 47 years had rotted off. And, uh, and where, you know, she says in the first 17 years is when she had the worst temptations where she wanted to return to her life in Alexandria, where she, you know, dreamed and about the food and, uh, and was cold and wanted to dress herself. But then after the 17 years, and, and it's, literally it splits her life up in two, uh, after the 17 years, uh, she uh, no longer has those needs. And so she lives you know, naked, but not, you know, not really uh, oblivious to the things around her that might, you know, burn her skin or freeze her, you know, so she's going through a transformation or a transfiguration that is uh, very interesting. And in the, in the icon, so she's usually shown with the cloak from him, from Father Zosimas. It, it is interesting because, um, you know, the, their, their lives are not meant to make us feel somehow bad or inadequate. Uh, they have decided to undertake this kind of austere spiritual and physical exercise so that they could uh, completely dominate uh, their physicality, showing, you know, that their, their mind and their commitment to God uh, can uh, limit what the body uh, wants and desires and not the other way around. And, uh, you know, so, so that's, and that this type of asceticism is not only in Christianity, find it in other traditions, you know, also Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, you know, so, so it, it's not completely unique because it, we, there is that struggle of, you know, 
that which is godly or spiritual in us and that which is physical. And unfortunately, many people live physically. Mm -hmm. It's about, I want this, this feels good. I'm going to do this because I, I want, I want, and I want to feel good. And uh, that's not, you know, always the best. And it definitely is not, um, you know, the way that we uh, emulate um, God and the message of Jesus. An interesting comparison is, like, if you see the the athletes, like for some of the Olympic sports, when they do like these uh, preparations for the triathlons, you know, that, that it, yeah, it's not for everyone. You can still learn from it. I think it's the same thing when we look at the the monastics and, and, you know, their desert life or in their, you know, living on top of a column. <laughs> And that, that's the interesting juxtaposition that we have between Zosimos and Mary. That Zosimos is already at that point in his life where um, I think he's become a little maybe spiritually bored. And, um, and so he has a moment of pride where he feels his perfection is adequate you know this is good enough and uh you know and that's where where he realizes that he needs to do something that there's got to be someone who's better someone who has gone further you know because um you know when it comes to the spiritual life we do not attain perfection here <laughs> you know we're in the process of and then, but perfection only comes in the very end in the life to come. And so and that imperfection belongs to God. So it's, there's always something to work on. And that's, that's, you see that pretty clearly when you, when you po pose, you pose uh, Zosimas and Mary, where in the way that she presents herself and the way she speaks, uh, she's very humble and there is no, uh, she is not at some finishing point. There, there's nothing, she's still in process, you know, 47 years and running. And, uh, and so that, and it's very obvious because you've got, he's kind of frustrated and she's, you know, still good to go, you know, <laughs> and she could have told him, she's like, you know, hey, uh, you're not you're not at my level yet because you can't float. <laughs> Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and 